Today, Tom Gager and members of his production team are headed to Indian Grave Point Cave. Tom is founder of both Real Musician Pro and Impulse Record. Real Musician Pro is widely known for its Grammy-considered productions, while his sister company, Impulse Record, is highly regarded in the industry as the go-to company for its one-of-a-kind impulse response files, like those captured at NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building. Huge arenas and stadiums and numerous other difficult-to-obtain recordings, like today's adventure. In layman's terms, much like a photographer captures literal images with his or her camera, Tom captures the room acoustics or impulse response files that are later added in the recording studio with incredible likeness and realism of the original room recorded. In other words, Tom takes acoustical snapshots of each space where he records that are as real to that space or room as that digital picture of you or a friend on vacation. This is very useful for general music production and sound design, but also for what the industry calls ADR, or Automated Dialogue Replacement. ADR is implemented when the original recorded audio in a TV drama or movie being filmed has imperfections or artifacting and the dialogue is later re-recorded and timed to the characters speaking on screen. You can imagine that having the ambience of the actual space where the original filming took place could be very useful to ADR work and blending in of the replaced audio. And beyond that, having great sounding concert halls, arenas, and other various size rooms are just plain fun for the average sound engineer to try out and work with. Today's adventure is Indian Grave Point Cave, named for the Native American ceremonies that took place there and is located in DeKalb County, Tennessee. The famous Battle of Snow Hill, April 3, 1863, that saw the fight between the Confederates and the 9th Cavalry is located just about a mile from this cave. Indian Grave Point Cave is a saltpeter wet cave and because of the ceremonies that took place is notorious for what many call ghost sightings. Although it would seem that what many claim is a ghost is purely vapor in very humid conditions. The cave has a depth of 112 feet and is a little over three miles long, making it the 41st longest cave in Tennessee. Still the largest in its area. To get into the cave, Tom and his team had to hike a hill that left some of the crew resting for a few minutes at the top before climbing down a rope and into the entrance of the cave. And this is before entering what cavers call the twilight zone, the area when you first enter the actual cave with some daylight going into the cool and dark of the interior. The twilight and entrance for caves all differ. With many, one descends until reaching that point, while some like this, hiking up to the entrance and others yet, on the sides of cliffs or even some needing to be entered underwater. But wherever you enter from, you'll most likely need to find your way back to, so it's always advisable to go in teams, mainly for safety in the event of an injury but also for others who will either help remember or read caving maps to get back to the twilight zone and back out of the cave. Many have gone missing and have never returned from a would-be caving adventure. Upon entering the cave, the team traveled through smaller rooms and halls with beautifully ribboned walls with flowstone and what they call drapery what actually looks like drapery of rock formation on the walls. Some ceilings were lined with gypsum, and when seen with light, they sparkle. It's a beautiful sight, along with some local friends who shared the adventure. While this cave is not as easy as some to maneuver around in, it's definitely not one of the easiest either, but worth it 
for some spectacular views of large coned stalagmites formed from dripping stalactites on the ceiling and straw stalactites seen throughout the cave, along with various rimmed pools of water and large column structures reaching from the floor to the ceiling. Navigating around the cave was fairly straightforward, but not without some difficulty. Some of the crew stayed back as others trekked up very slippery rope ladders to gain access to other parts of this cave. In the end, the crew was able to record six different rooms and spaces in the cave, with some in 5.1 surround. Recording impulse response files is not rocket science, but with all of the physical hazards of this type of recording, coupled with running and dripping water, made this a real challenge. Almost anyone can set up mics and gear in a quiet room, but capturing really unique spaces, especially in outside environments, or in this case, in the belly of a cave, can become quite difficult. Okay. Noise and the lack of available recording equipment make for unique experiences such as this. When reviewing the files back in the studio, the team was amazed at the diversity and quality of the impulse response files captured, all within a hike made underground in a beautiful setting. There are usually one of three methods introduced when recording or measuring an impulse response. The transient method, the swept sign, and the maximum length sequences method. There are other methods, but these are the most common but the transient the most common by far because of affordability, portability, and ease of use. In order to record a space, any space, the room has to figuratively speaking talk back or say something frequency-wise. There's nothing to record in a quiet room except for minor background noise, HVAC, or possible hum from lighting. So while these methods are all different, they're used for the same purpose, to inject audio energy and create a signal to record. The transient method uses either a balloon pop, starter pistol, spark gap, or concrete nailer, to name a few of the most popular. The inherent problem with the transient method is that it's an all-or-nothing approach, and there are differences in the balloon wall thickness and by how much each balloon is inflated. Each of these factors causes significant changes to the frequency and greater longitudinal pressure of the balloon pop, hence greater differences in the impulse response outcomes or the accurateness of the audio picture of the room. The balloon is popped, the room recorded, with all sound spectrum introduced at the same time. With a swept sign setup, speakers are brought in, set up, and a swept sine wave is run over a period of time. What makes the swept sine wave a much better approach most of the time is the known and constant quantity. A swept sine wave from 20 hertz, below most human hearing, to 20,000 hertz, above most human hearing, is swept usually from 30 to 60 seconds through a known speaker system in the room. Even a speaker that is used can be analyzed to see what frequencies are artificially lower or higher from manufacturing and the end result adjusted to make the swept sine wave as close to a perfect frequency sweep as possible. So you can now understand why swept sine waves are the preferred method, but they take a lot more work, pulling in expensive equipment to do it and then in the studio afterward as well. The other and almost more important factor of a swept sine wave is that it is by far much quieter, resulting in beautiful reverb tales at the end of large churches or concert halls. There are a number of reasons for that, but the main reason, to simplify it, is because while the transient method is an all-or-nothing approach, the swept sine wave method is recording and really only concerned about current frequency range. In other words, as the rumble of a truck goes by and the recording of the downtown church is being recorded, all hope is not lost 
because while the truck is rumbling by in the lower frequency range, our swept sine wave, we'll say, is currently at 6 kilohertz, way above the truck rumbling frequency, which might have been recorded 20 seconds earlier prior to the truck rolling on by. When we process the files, the truck rumble is much easier to manipulate and minimize and will be mitigated to a large extent simply by the swept sign method outcome. While if we were using the transient method, it would be front and center in our file and difficult to remove. So, with all of these different methods to record impulse response files, Tom generally chooses the method that is most practical. In this case, the transient method would have to be employed because of portability issues, no electricity, and even if a generator were used, it wouldn't even be close to practical. The team had to ensure that every injection of sound energy was as close to a known constant as possible. Right now, you are listening to the impulse response file recorded from room one. Notice the difference in room two, a much darker reverb. Here, in room three, a little smaller, and note that every room we recorded in sounds different. Room four has a little longer reverb time than room three. And room five looks more like a typical swept sine wave under the audio microscope, with a highly defined and visible impulse spike on the front end. Room six has clearly defined reflections coming from nearby surfaces that aren't quite as visible within the other files. This has been the Photography of Sound, Indian Grave Point Cave Edition. We hope you've enjoyed this video and learned some new and fascinating concepts with impulse response technology. Mr. Geiger is available for workshops and seminars, along with guest lecturing and keynote speeches, and may be contacted either by phone or email.